the Labor Department is out with jaw-dropping new numbers. Unemployment claims skyrocketing with 6.6 .6 million people filing in the last week alone. It's still 1.5 million. It's still an enormous number. One of the clearly worst parts of what's happened over the last couple of months is this taken a much worse toll on the African-American community. I feel sad because I can't provide for my kids like I normally would. You're uncertain about today or tomorrow. You're just living moment to moment. Salcido had to lay off her all Latino staff. It's time to say goodbye to Mario Cafe Grand Reserve. They do the jobs that other people don't want to do. I'm ready to go back. I need to go back. Wall Street is set to open up higher. And the Nasdaq set a record and passed the 10,000 mark. What a tear stocks have been on. There's a huge disconnect. You got 30 million people out of work in the stock market, and the Nasdaq is at record highs. Okay. Together we built the greatest economy in history, and now we have to bring it back. We still have a lot of hardship, but it looks like we've hit a turning point. Hi there, this is America in Crisis, Economic Turning Point. I'm NBC's Stephanie Rule. I'm Jose diaz Bullard with NBC News and Telemundo. And I'm CNBC's Wilfred Frost. Throughout this very special hour, we will examine a nation in crisis and rapidly reaching an economic turning point. Americans started this year working. Our unemployment rate was at a 50-year low. Yet somewhere between half and three quarters of all Americans were living paycheck to paycheck. And that was before the pandemic, before the country shut down and put tens of millions of people out of work. Now, a huge number of Americans are struggling, many of them for the first time. If you look at the new jobs report, it appears the economy is on the right track. For the month of June, we saw the economy add nearly five million jobs. That's after adding nearly three million in May. But remember, we lost more than 22 million jobs in March and April. That means we've only recovered about one in three of those lost jobs. And as bad as things have been, they may be on the verge of getting worse. Those enhanced unemployment benefits from the government run out at the end of this month. Rents and mortgages that have been put off are going to come due. All that would be bad enough if we were beating this virus. And a month ago, it looked like we were. But... All those gains now seem to have been reversed. Cases are up, hospitalizations are up, and more states are clamping down on their reopenings. Of course, the impact is being felt in different ways. For many people at the top of the economic food chain, it may be just an inconvenience. Perhaps they have to work from home. And if they have money in the market, that's even better. We actually just finished the best quarter for the Dow in decades. But many working class Americans don't have the option to work from home. And the jobs they were counting on in a bar or restaurant or a retail store may not be coming back as soon as they'd hoped. NBC Business and Technology correspondent Jolene Kent looks at just how we got here. When the coronavirus hit the U.S. economy, it came fast and furious. There's the circuit breaker, oh, uh, 2549, great. 48, and, and the bell. The nation went into a panic, stocking up and shocking our supply chain as millions began working and teaching from home. Our skies and airports emptied out. Normal life canceled as millions of businesses, big and small, closed, pushing us into the worst global recession in history. I was sick to my stomach, like doing numbers and going, okay, how long can I do this? In less than three weeks, the grim new reality devastated millions. All jobs created since the 2008 financial crisis wiped out by layoffs and furloughs. It was probably the hardest thing I've ever done as a manager. Roughly 50 million unemployment claims filed in the span of just four months. Well, I had to make sure that my kids are able to eat. Every industry impacted, with 42% of job losses expected to become permanent. The worst off sectors, retail with 2 million jobs lost, restaurants with almost 5 million unemployed, and leisure and hospitality down 4.4 million workers. The pandemic also exacerbating existing inequality. Black workers, women, and the low income hit harder than others. Meanwhile, major retailers like JCPenney, J. Crew, and Neiman Marcus, already struggling pre-pandemic, falling like dominoes into bankruptcy. 
The mass joblessness swamped state labor departments ill-equipped to handle the historic onslaught of applications for unemployment. The deep pain playing out in long lines at food banks throughout the country. It's embarrassing. It's the first time I've ever done this. Americans have also come to depend on frontline retail workers like never before. Literally like a three foot distance between us and a customer. So that scares me. Working the checkouts behind new plexiglass and filling unprecedented demand inside Amazon warehouses. We do not feel safe in this building. And now businesses are closing up again in Florida, Texas and California. The road to recovery tougher than ever with the crisis expected to last till at least the end of next year. Joe Link Kent, NBC News, Los Angeles. Gentlemen, this is clearly a very, very complicated time. While the president calls it a rocket ship recovery, at best, it's a rocky road to recovery. And if you think about June, it's really this snapshot of a moment in time. And that moment was kind of the best moment we've had in the last few months. Realize there was so much government support. It's when the stimulus checks were hitting. It's when those expanded unemployment benefits were finally getting to millions of people. And that obviously impacts consumer spending. As far as hiring goes, we know that that's when all 50 states at one level or another were having reopenings. And when so many small businesses, remember it was over $600 billion, got that PPP money, it meant they had to go out there and hire if they wanted that money to be a grant, not a loan. Stephanie, I, I, I agree. And I think one of yeah, the key I mean, points look, the you, that you mentioned there was, uh, was the stimulus part of this. Uh, and we need that stimulus to continue uh, to make sure things don't get cemented where they are at the moment. It was an unprecedentedly fast spike into recession from 3.5 percent unemployment to close to 15 percent in the space of two or three months. That was matched by unprecedented uh, both government fiscal and central bank monetary support on the flip side. Uh, and in the short term, that's just about paping over the cracks. Uh, but if we don't see it extended or the economy continue to bounce back quickly, we could be in a much worse situation. You know, I, I keep thinking about the fact that, you know, right before this hit, the economy, you know, we had uh, Latino unemployment, the lowest number in history, African-American unemployment, the lowest. And all of a sudden, you know, Stephanie, you talk about a, a rocket ship. There was a rocket ship that went boom, right up against the wall. And the drop was so fast, so substantial, so important that the impact it's having throughout this country and the communities most affected, uh, it's really immeasurable. It, it, you know, we were talking about up to 42 percent of some of the jobs simply may not return at all. Think about what that means for people that have, just until four months ago, had a pretty good optimistic view of their future here. But, but Jose, I'm going to be a little bit optimistic. And Wilford, you can probably speak to this. We can't compare this unemployment to any other time in history, right? When people talk about the Great Recession, this is different. Mm -hmm. This was a forced economic shutdown. You're talking about four months ago, things were rocking and rolling for people. It wasn't that demand suddenly disappeared. It's that we were faced with a health crisis. And in order to get our arms around it, we had to shut down the economy. So we artificially turned it off. And we will see a, a faster recovery than we would if it were a normal normal mass layoff. Wouldn't you say, Wolf? Yeah, that's certainly what we're all hoping, uh, Stephanie. As you say, why is this recession different from any others? As we said, the pace with which we entered it, the uh, scale of the stimulus we're getting, but also the trigger of it being a health crisis as opposed to something economic or financial. And uh, believe it or not, the financial system actually still fairly strong at the moment, which is important to maintain, certainly compared to the 08, 09 crisis. And just in terms of uh, the timing and the length, we actually, ironically, come into this recession after the longest expansion ever, 126 months, uh, over uh, a decade. Uh, and we have to hope uh, that coming out of it, it will be one of the shortest recessions ever because the severity of it isn't really sustainable for more than a couple of quarters. The financial markets have weathered extraordinarily well, in large part because of the Fed action. Fed Chair Jay Powell saying he would do whatever it takes, and he is doing it, and that's great for those who are invested in the markets. But the jobs numbers, the jobs numbers that we are looking at highlight inequalities that Jose was referencing, ones we've been talking about addressing for years. White-collar jobs that can be done remotely, they've been much more stable. But low-wage jobs, service jobs, many of which are held by minorities, are held by immigrants, 
they're in a much worse shape. That has been the case for a very long time, but rarely has this difference been so painfully obvious. Of the nearly 50 million Americans who recently filed for unemployment benefits, a disproportionate number are black. I feel sad because I can't provide for my kids like I normally would. I've had several breakdowns from all this. You don't know where your next dollar is coming in from. In February, the unemployment rate hit an almost 20 year low for black Americans. Just three months later, it skyrocketed higher than it's been since 1983. In Baltimore, veteran hairstylist Sherry Scipio's schedule had been full for more than 30 years. Are you scared? Absolutely. Her salon's been closed since March. Reopening, she says, is still too risky. I still can't even go in the market and buy Lysol. I can't find some of the things that I need in order to safely open. Closure or risk exposure was what I was faced with. There's also the financial risk. 50% capacity, but I'm going to be responsible for 100% of all of my financial responsibilities. And no matter how I added it up, the money wasn't there, the numbers weren't there. One in four black women lost their jobs between February and April, and they're not just dealing with employment and opportunity disparities, but health too. African Americans are four times more likely to be hospitalized for coronavirus. We're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. The most unprotected group are black women. And oftentimes it's because you're dealing with this two-headed monster of racism and sexism that becomes so difficult to be able to break free from. Tony Fletcher opened a catering company two years ago. Business was booming. I was feeling great. I was feeling empowered. And then this happened. When stay-at-home orders went into effect, the money stopped instantly. Fletcher says she filed for unemployment in April, but didn't get her first check until late June, which includes the extra $600 in unemployment assistance, a benefit set to run out this month. If it's not extended, what could that mean for you? It's going to be devastating. I, I really don't know how I'm going to be able to live. These grim unemployment numbers for black Americans highlight inequalities that we have been talking about addressing for years. But clearly efforts aren't working or not enough. So how are we going to solve for that? I have the perfect guest to discuss it. Right now we are joined by our very special guest, Melody Hobson. She's the co-CEO and president of Ariel Investments. She sits on the executive boards of J.P. Morgan Chase, Starbucks, and Quibi, and she's a nationally recognized voice on financial literacy. Melody, thank you so much for joining us. Policymaking, the government, clearly not improving things. So can business leadership today address these disparities? It's not a question of can they, they have to. Business is finding itself in a situation where it has to step up and plug the holes that exist where government just can no longer do the job. We've seen that time and time again. This is just another example of it. And the good news is, I think a lot of corporate leaders really understand this newfound responsibility cannot be avoided. And they're taking up the mantle for social change. Their employees are demanding it. Their customers are asking a lot of questions and holding them, them accountable. And they recognize if they want to be world-class 21st century organizations, they have to be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. But this didn't come out of thin air. This has been a problem since the, since the dawn of time. Wes Moore said that corporate America hasn't just failed to help the black community. He says it is complicit in generating the disparities that we're seeing today. Would you agree with that? This is what I would say. It's called systematic racism for a reason. It just didn't start last year or the year before. There's 400 years of history here where this foundation has built, been built up. It exists everywhere in this country. And there is no one that can say they haven't seen it or don't understand it because it's been in front of us. We saw it in, in a big way during the civil rights period, and we're now seeing it because of something very simple, this, that is recording the actions of injustice. But this is not new. We've seen it for a long time. So corporate America is now has to understand its role and be a part of the solution and understand where systematic racism exists in their own organization. You actually have a formula when you talk about what corporations should be doing. Can you walk us through it? 
we talk about the three P's. So we are members of Fortune 500 boards who are black and some Latinx board members as well. We come together, together every year at a conference called the Black Corporate Directors Conference that my company sponsors with Russell Reynolds and Deloitte, the big accounting firm, and Russell Reynolds, the search firm. And we tell, uh, black directors and Latinx directors that they should be a part of what we call a call to action to make sure that the civil rights agenda is not left out of the boardroom and specifically to address what we call the three P's, people, purchasing, and philanthropy. Now we're hearing a lot about philanthropy th these days. We think that's the tail that wags the dog. It's important, but the change has to happen not without, within. You have to fix your own house first before you think about how charity can affect our country. We want the charity to be there, but we want corporations to recognize what they can do at home. People count. As I like to say, math has no opinion. Where is the leadership? And then go through the entire organization by ethnicity and look at the numbers. It will be extraordinarily revealing and you will see where the holes exist and where the inequality exists in your organization. Next, purchasing. We like the concept of business diversity. Who as an organization are you doing business with? and making sure that everyone gets included and count across all categories, legal, accounting, all areas where you spend money. Are you being inclusive in giving opportunities to diverse businesses, African-American, Latinx, minority businesses? But of those Fortune 500 companies, here's the thing. Only five of them are led by a black CEO, zero have a black female CEO. What gives you confidence that this call to action will actually be met with something real? So I want incentives tied to these outcomes, like we have incentives on everything else in corporate America, and I want targets not quotas, targets, because we are used to targets. We have earnings targets, we have profitability targets. Targets are in the DNA of corporate America as our incentives. You get what you incent. So I want leaders at the top held accountable for the diversity of their organization. They can't just talk about it. They actually have to see their pay affected by that outcome, like it is affected by all other outcomes that matter. And I also want to see them hold their individual people accountable, the leadership on down, accountable for diversity. You can't be a superstar at an organization and get your full bonus if your team is not diverse, is what I am saying. And then I'd like to see that same accountability happen as it relates to purchasing. So between incentives and setting targets, what are our targets for an inclusive organization, which hopefully look somewhat similar to the, the demographics of the United States, that's a start, that I think will lead to a better outcome. But we can't just wishful think our way into a better outcome or be emotional and have our hearts in the right place. This is about math and counting. Does it need to come before corporate America even has a role to play? Does it need to go back to education, specifically financial literacy? When you look at how black women have been disproportionately hurt out of jobs during this pandemic, it's because they have the lowest wage service worker roles and they don't have white collar jobs that can easily be done from home. Should we start to look at the way we're educating all of America and positioning people? So here's my problem with that statement. That is a long-term fix. I think that there are short-term solutions that can move the needle on these inequality issues, which have to do with economic inequality. I 100% agree with you. But if we start with dealing with economic inequality inside of corporate America today, that needle can get moved. We've talked a lot about uh, gender uh, pay equity differences, and a lot of companies have done gender pay studies. I think you should do racial pay studies as well inside of organizations so those, those differences also get realized. But to me, the education problem, that's when you get into the big, hard problems that America absolutely needs to fix. I'm not saying it's not important, but I would like not, that not to distract us from, again, the opportunity that corporate America has to fix its own house.
Amen to that. Melody, thank you so much for joining us. Your words, your work, your effort, it couldn't be more important, especially at a time like this. Thanks. What an important conversation. Gentlemen, you, you heard know, it right there. Some of the uh, people that you had on, absolutely. And you know what, Steph, the, the quote uh, that sticks in my mind is uh, the person that you interviewed before said, we're all in the same storm, we're just in, not in the same boat. And, and the inequality is so pervasive across the board, but especially when you talk, Stephanie, about the, the CEOs and the boards, you know? But, 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 Jose, think about those women I spoke to in Baltimore for just a minute. Reopening is not just turning a light back on like it was a snow day and heading back out there. We say, oh, when we reopen, we'll all be well and good. If you run a small business, yep. a salon, for example, you can only be at 50 percent capacity. Only 20 percent of your customers want to come back. But, oh, by the way, you've got 100 percent of your overhead costs and the expense of adhering yep. to all these new protocols. That's huge, too. This is going to be a long, complicated road. A very long and very complicated road. Up next, we're going to focus on the Latino community, where losing their jobs is not the only concern when America in crisis economic turning point returns. Welcome back to our special America in Crisis economic turning point. The worldwide pandemic knows no boundaries, and there is no evidence to suggest any ethnic or racial group is more susceptible to it than others. However, there is one group being impacted at staggering rates, more so than any other. Telemundo's Julio Vaqueiro is live with that. Julio. That's right, Jose. The minority groups have been more affected by this pandemic. And let's focus on the Latino community. Right now, I'm in South Florida, where many Latinos work in one of the most affected industries during this crisis, the leisure and hospitality sector. Um, about a quarter of those workers are Latinos. And today we know that the unemployment rate on, in this industry is, is improving. It's around 30 percent, but that's still very high if we consider that it was around 5 percent a year ago. And that's only one sector, only one example, if we look at the bigger picture, things don't look good for Latinos either. Unemployment rate is around 11 percent right now. It's over 15 percent for Latinos right now. So we can see how this coronavirus has just exacerbated the, the U.S. unemployment gap uh, during the last couple of months. And Julio, when you talk about essential workers, they're really space out throughout the entire economy in this country. Sometimes they're, they're almost invisible for many. That's correct, Jose. And that's ironic because as we see many Latinos losing their jobs, we also see many Latinos who are deemed as essential workers and they have to go out and risk their lives. So that explains why Latinos represent 18 percent of the population in the United States, but they represent 34 percent of the coronavirus cases nationwide. And uh, so, yeah, the, the rising COVID-19 cases around the Latino community, it's quite alarming. Julio Vaqueiro, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's talk about those essential workers. We're talking farmers, supermarket employees, the people who have to expose themselves daily to make ends meet. Telemundo's Guadalupe Venega spoke to a family in California who is doing everything possible to stay afloat. Guadalupe. Jose, we're going to show you uh, the story of this family in Central California, an entire family of essential workers. But I'd like to touch up on a group of people. This is a category that we don't know much about because they don't reflect, those numbers don't reflect in the statistics that we have. I'm talking about the undocumented workers that are part of this essential workforce. Now, according to the Migration Policy Institute, they've done an estimate uh, using the data by the U.S. Census and their own methodology. They calculate about 11.3 million workers of our, in the American workforce are undocumented. Now, there's no way of knowing how many have lost their job and how many are still working. These are people, have you guys, as you guys have mentioned, that work in the restaurant industry, in the bars, that work in accommodation, transportation, construction, and many of them also work in the farming industry. We're going to show you the story of this family in Central California that today they all have a job and they're happy to be going to work every day. The hardest is the picking. 
For decades, Librado Lara has worked in the fields in California. He's one of the estimated 2.4 million undocumented farm workers in the United States. We just live paycheck to paycheck. I mean, that's how yeah. you don't have no savings, nothing. And because he's undocumented, he cannot receive unemployment benefits if he loses his job in California's Central Valley, where his work helps produce one-fourth of the nation's food. His wife, Belen, who's also undocumented, has a job stocking shelves and selling produce at a convenience store. We need to work. <laughs> we need to go out and make some money. Meanwhile, their daughter, Evelyn, recently took on a full-time job at the local Walmart after her senior year was canceled by the virus. I need the money for college. My parents aren't going to pay for everything. Growing evidence from the California Department of Health shows Latinos are disproportionately exposed and affected by the virus. For the Lara family, also providing an essential job as both parents live in the shadows while the pandemic keeps affecting the economy. The coronavirus, because that's all they talk about these two months. <laughs> But I just don't want to worry about it. If it happens, God knows. <laughs> Today, the family says they're fortunate to have a job because they know the federal government has chosen to keep them out of any economic aid given to American families. Now, in California, uh, the governor did decide to set aside $75 million to help precisely undocumented workers that have lost their job. This is very significant because it's the first time state authorities use taxpayer money to help the undocumented workforce. Now, here's the thing about that. We have about 2 million people that would be eligible for this aid. This is going to be $500 per individual, maximum of $1,000 per household. However, the amount of money that has been set aside would only help about one-eighth of the people that qualify. It's still significant because of the action being taken by the government using taxpayer money. And we must note that a lot of undocumented workers do file taxes and do uh, pay taxes in other ways, retail, and when they buy other products in the state of California. So that is what it's like uh, for the people that are undocumented and are also part of the American workforce. Jose. Part of the American workforce and yet invisible so many times for so many people, including the government that doesn't really take into consideration the fact that, as well, Lupa, you said up to a fourth of the food that we all consume comes from California and comes from many times hands that don't have their papers but they do have their disposition to work in the United States of America. Guadalupe Venegas, thank you very much. Now, coronavirus has struck uh, the core of the hospitality industry as well. Millions of people have lost their jobs. Companies have had to lay off employees that in some cases have been loyal for them for, for years. The Hispanic community has been particularly impacted. Here with us is Alex Frizon, the CFO of Add one global. Alice, it's good to see you today. Talk to me about it's had an impact on your company. I mean, you're in the service industry. You, you deal with hotels uh, and hotel management. Uh, you've had a direct hit as far as your company. You've had to, to let go a lot of people. Hi, Jose. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, yes, uh, as you mentioned, you know, for, in our industry, uh, it's been very tough. Uh, we have uh, the majority of our hotels are in Florida, and a large number of them are in Orlando, which, as you know, the parks, even though Universal reopened already, Disney is going to reopen soon. Uh, and yeah, it, it's been uh, very difficult. You know, at some point, uh, we had about, it went down to having about 28% of our regular revenue, uh, and a few of our hotels were closed. And Alex, how do you reopen? I mean, how, what's your long-term plan or process when we're still living through COVID and it doesn't seem like it's going to be going away anytime soon? Yeah, you know, the good part has been, you know, the, the programs the government put in place did help us. The PPP program helped us at least uh, in the short term. Um, obviously, uh, working with our lenders, uh, and most of them have been accommodating uh, to some point and an understanding of the situation. Uh, on the more medium term, there's other programs like the Main Street loan program that we're working on uh, that will hopefully assist us uh, in the coming months and years. 
And long term, the industry, you know, we feel is going to come back very strong, but it's going to take a few years. I think uh, most of the nationwide analysts uh, feel that it will come back to normal. You know, depends where we are, somewhere between 2022 and 2023. Um, and uh, but you know, as that we become a more efficient company, uh, we try to implement new technologies yeah. and new ways of doing business to uh, improve. Has your industry changed forever? We feel so. Uh, we feel that there are some things that are going to uh, be more strong. Obviously, our industry has always been very strong at, on, on cleaning, and we have to be uh, always vigilant of that. Uh, but I think now it's going to even a more drastic measures. You know, we're starting to use electrostatic sprayers, you know, hospital gray disinfectants on the rooms and things like that will always be uh, different. There's also the question of uh, buffets, uh, breakfast uh, on the hotels. You know, is that going to change? It has changed at least for now. And we don't know the impact of that in the, in the mid to long term. Todo eso con costos adicionales. All of that was additional costs that you have to assume. Correct. So, yes. Correct. So, you know, but it also comes then, you know, how do we do other tasks more efficiently? How do we use technology uh, to advance and uh, reduce costs, hopefully, in some other areas uh, to be uh, a stronger and a better company in the future? You know, I think uh, most of the time uh, when situations like this happen, you know, good companies, the better companies, they, they try to improve and, and become stronger with this. Alex Fitzong, uh, thank you very much for, for being with us today. Now, the fear of losing your home in the middle of a pandemic is very real. In 2018, almost 11 million renters in the U.S. spent more than half of their income on housing, that according to a report by Harvard University, with the staggering levels of unemployment today, many Latinos now fear they won't be able to make ends meet. 47 percent of renters ages 18 to 64 reported having trouble paying their rent utilities and even medical care costs to, to the pandemic, according to a survey from the Urban Institute. Blacks and Latinos have struggled most probably due to the disproportionate unemployment levels in their communities. About a quarter of these renters reported not paying or having to defer rent in May. This compared to 14 percent of white renters. Many are safe for now. Through the CARES Act, the federal government banned evictions in federally assisted properties at least until July the 25th. But this leaves out two-thirds of more than 43 million renters in the country. Some cities and states have put their own temporary eviction moratoriums. But without a permanent solution, the fear of losing your home remains rampant, primarily among black and Latino renters. Uh, absolutely, Jose. And, and uh, the interesting thing so far, and, and this sort of speaks to that balance of, about the haves versus the have-nots in society, is that uh, we haven't seen the same pressure so far for home owners as opposed to, to home renters. And that's largely because of help from the government, not necessarily help direct to individuals, but because the government has allowed banks to extend mortgage payments, to delay mortgage payments for 12 months. Therefore, there have been no forced foreclosures uh, for homeowners completely different from the 2008-2009 crisis. Now, that could look very different next year, but so far for homeowners, uh, they've been all right. And an extension of that point, data this week showed that home sales actually jumped 40 percent in May after two months of 20 percent uh, declines. Mm. But if you've still got your job, uh, with interest rates where they are, you've probably got access to the most attractive mortgage rate you've ever been uh, offered. And uh, again, it could look very different next year. But right now, uh, things for homeowners have been fine. And it could look very different, though, for renters, as you said, if we don't see that eviction ban extended past July 25. But again, homeowners, 
uh, if you go down the economic food chain, are more financially secure. And mm -hmm. I go back to your earlier conversation, Jose, about undocumented immigrants. Even if you have a hard-line stance on immigration, we've got 11 million undocumented immigrants living in this country, and they are not living tomorrow. This economic crisis is directly linked to a health crisis, which right now is most notably spreading through community spread. So you've got 11 million people who, during shutdowns, and we may get shut down again, do not have access to go out there and make money on their own. They most likely live in very small quarters, and they don't have access. In California, one state, they have access to some government funding. But on a federal level, we are leaving those 11 million people out in the cold at a time when we are asking everyone to change their behavior to protect all of us. It's very complicated. It's amazing to think about, uh, friends, the fact that even under the, the current law, if you live in a mixed status family, in other words, if you're an American citizen and you're married to an undocumented and you file taxes together, you as an American are unqualified, cannot receive any federal assistance under these programs. How does that make sense? And how does that in any way help this economy get back together again? Well, it's a, it's a big question. Well, I will just tell you, Jose, in, in, in the HEROES Act that the Democrats look to pass, it addresses that. Unfortunately, it didn't make its way past the House. Well, uh, we'll have to see if uh, anything replaces it. At the moment, we don't have uh, answers to those questions, guys. And up next, we're going to pose another one, the $600 question. Just how far does that extra unemployment benefit go in helping the families who need it most? When our special coverage continues. Welcome back to America in Crisis, economic turning point. Earlier this morning, the U.S. non-farm payrolls report showed a second month of strong rebounds for the jobs market, although those gains are still relatively small compared to the initial collapse. The unemployment rate, for example, has retraced to 11.1 percent, having peaked at 14.7 percent in April. In February, it was down at 3.5 percent. The sectors that have been hit hardest have been leisure and hospitality. This morning's data showed they're also rebounding fastest as well. Given that more than ever, those that lost their job did so through no fault of their own and that the losses were so sudden, the government included in the CARES Act an additional $600 per week in federal pandemic unemployment compensation to everyone qualifying for their state's unemployment benefit. Some 30 million people are currently receiving those payments which are due to expire on the 31st of July. CNBC's Rahel Solomon explores how important that extra $600 has been for those who have lost their job. Within about 48 hours, I lost everything. For 37-year-old Boston-based actress, tour guide, and freelancer Alyssa Cordero, the financial impact from coronavirus hit like an avalanche. My tours were canceled. Any bartending work I had scheduled was canceled. My teaching was canceled. I think I netted about a $5,000 income loss in 48 hours, and it just kind of grew from there. With jobs drying up and cash dwindling, she says she and her partner, Eric McGowan, also a performer, faced a frightening reality. Our lives and our livelihood is, is gone. I am broke. I am jobless. I don't know what to do. Strangers on social media Venmoed her money. She applied for grants. And for the first time, Cordero signed up for unemployment. She takes home $693 a week after taxes, including the additional $600 provided by the CARES Act. But that benefit is set to expire July 31st, and whether to extend it has become controversial. I can't begin to tell you how many businesses, large and small, have gotten in touch with us, directly or indirectly, saying how hard it is to rehire if we keep the $600 uh, federal plus up. Study after study, including a recent one from the Federal Reserve Bank in Chicago, is showing that unemployment insurance benefits actually increases work search intensity. Um, the worst thing you can do is to cut them. Although research out of the Becker Friedman Institute finds two thirds of workers on unemployment are making more than their prior earnings, and one fifth almost double their earnings. Uh, this is up for Alyssa. Cordero says for her, the benefit has been no windfall. She's bringing home about the same amount as if she had worked. It's going to keep my bills paid, it's going to keep the rent paid, it's going to keep us fed and sheltered. It's essential. We're not asking for handouts. 
we're asking for a lifeline. If there is one thing both sides fear, it's the economic impact of a long recovery. I know it's going to be a long road to get back to where we to where we need to be. Rahel joins uh, me now, along with our CNBC senior economics reporter, Steve Leesman. Rahel, uh, Ms. Cordiero clearly keen to get back to work. From your reporting, is she the exception or the norm in that regard? From what we have found, Wilf, anecdotally, she is the norm. You know, we talk a lot about how much people are taking home, but there are other factors that people who are unemployed are considering. Job security, that is a huge thing that people at home have to consider. We know that this $600 a week will not last forever. It could end, as we have mentioned, as early as this month. So people would rather be employed and have the security of having a job than be unemployed and potentially be making more. But there are also factors, the benefits that come with being employed. And also, we'll, we have heard people tell us that they just like the structure to their day, the purpose that comes along with being at work and having a job. We spoke to a lawyer in Boston who told us that, yes, because she had to take a pay cut, she would be making less by going back to work. But she took her job because she said she was tired of being at home watching Hulu. So there are a lot of people who, of course, enjoy work and would prefer to be back to work, even if that means they're making a little bit less. Now, uh, there's a big debate as to whether this uh, extra $600 unemployment benefit will be uh, extended beyond uh, the end of July. I actually caught up this morning with the vice president, Mike Pence, and asked him for an update uh, of whether there'll be plans to extend it. I think that you've heard the president say we, we have a real concern about uh, creating an uh, unintended incentive for people to stay on the sidelines in this economy. And that $600 plus up in unemployment, many believe, has contributed to that. Now, you see these numbers today. People are coming off the sideline. The increase in labor participation is encouraging. But the next rescue package, which President Trump has made clear that, that uh, we're supportive of, uh, really needs to focus on, on growth and, and getting people back in the workforce, but also growing this economy. Steve, it seems like uh, no plans, therefore, to extend the unemployment benefit as we, uh, as we stand here today. How important has that extra $600 been in making sure the eco economy hasn't fallen worse than it has? It's been absolutely critical, Wilf. Uh, it's been something that's helped uh, keep retail sales aloft. It's kept people in their homes. Uh, it's kept them solvent. It's kept them from uh, filing bankruptcy. <clears throat> Pardon me. The number of, uh, uh, of people who have been helped by this program, it's really unusual, Wilf, to get uh, a government program uh, like this in the middle of a recession that's sort of timed correctly to really hit the economy when it's needed most. And uh, there, there's a really legitimate issue and debate as to whether or not it's going to be needed further. If these folks have a place to go back to, then, yeah, you want to uh, either reduce the $600 or even get rid of it. But it's entirely unclear if they'll have a safe place to go back to, if they can go back because of schools. And I think the, this issue of people not wanting to go back, I, I think is overstated. I think Rahel's reporting kind of backs that up. Steve, uh, which have been the sectors most affected? Well, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, job losses, it's, it's, it's leisure and hospitality and retail. And, and those are going to be the places where, you know, wages are not that strong. And so, yes, there will be trouble getting some people back to work. Uh, but the critical issue becomes with the second wave, I guess you could call it, or the extension of the first wave of the virus spreading around, um, are those places safe to go back to? And there's a really interesting quandary out there, which is that workers who are offered a job, Wilf, uh, and refuse it, they can lose their benefits if the re uh, employer reports that to the unemployment office. So um, mm -hmm. making sure that there's a safe place to go back to is absolutely critical here. Rahel, uh, even if that extra federal $600 <clears throat> of benefits uh, does not get extended, where, where do we stand on state unemployment benefits? Any extensions there? So there is actually a program called Extension Benefits EB, which has triggered on in 48 of the 50 states. So I think the only exceptions right now are Utah and South Dakota. Essentially, what that provides is 13 to 20 weeks of additional unemployment when you have exhausted your state unemployment fund. So through the CARES Act, it's completely federally funded. And so we're now starting to see people need to tap into that what I can say, though, also is that state trust funds right now, the sort of pool of money that they use to pay unemployment, that is tapped. We are seeing so many states start to say that they need to borrow from the federal trust fund to sort of assist and pay for unemployment. So uh, as far as the state of 
unemployment right now. People are still being paid. And there is, again, that extension of benefits that the federal government is providing. And then you also have the state trust fund accounts, which are tapped. And you're starting to see states start to need to borrow from the federal government just to cover those costs, Wolf. Rahel and Steve, thank you both uh, very much for joining us. And uh, Stefan and Jose, if we just quickly pause, unemployment numbers since March caused by the virus, 22 million jobs were lost. 7.5 million have been added back, but that still leaves around 15 million people that have lost their job through no fault of their own. And that extra benefit at the moment stands to expire at the end of this month. And Wilford, we have to remember a huge portion of Americans working families. It's not just, do people not want to go back to work? Do they enjoy work life? We don't have schools open in this country. In mm -hmm. many states, there's no child care programs. There's no camps. If you're a working family in the United States of America, there is nowhere to send your kids right now. And with school-aged kids, you've got to care for them at home. It's easy to say, oh, those people are just hooked up with $600. Come on, we've got kids to look after. Absolutely. And uh, just the final and not cliff, only that, uh, to... Yeah. Sorry, Jose. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say the final cliff is, uh, of course, uh, roughly in September because state benefits last 26 weeks, typically, depending which state you're in. Uh, if you lost your job in March because of the virus, you'd lose that as well by roughly September. Mm -hmm. And then we're seeing the hospitalizations going up. We're seeing the transmission of COVID spreading once again in our country. So it doesn't bode well for things getting any better soon. As a matter of fact, it looks like things are going to get worse. And what are these people that, that, that have to get back to work? But how do you get back to work if it's not safe? And that leaves the big question, who is liable if you're back at work? and you're not safe. Trust me, that is a big conversation being had right now in Washington. And gentlemen, yes. let's take a quick break. Up next, we've got some final thoughts about where we are right now when it comes to the economy, when it comes to the markets. Never forget, the stock market and the U.S. economy, they are not the same thing. Stick around. This is America in Crisis, Economic Turning Point. You see all these news conferences, how they're going to help us, how they're going to be here for small business. But the only thing I've been seeing is big business being helped out. They've really let me down. They've not only let me down, they've let millions of people down. Welcome back to America in Crisis, Economic Turning Point. There have been so many questions about the stock market versus the economy. And as we've been discussing, the U.S. economy has experienced an unprecedented slowdown. And while improving, the improvement thus far has been minimal relative to the fall, as highlighted by the unemployment data we've been discussing all throughout this show. But if we look at the stock markets, the bounce back has been ferocious. The S&P 500 is up 35 percent from its March 23 low. The tech-heavy Nasdaq index up 47 percent. It's now 13 percent above where it began 2020. The stock market, therefore, very much experiencing a V-shaped recovery. Straight down, then straight back up. So why the discrepancy with the economy? Well, first and foremost, enormous stimulus from the Federal Reserve. Whether this is cutting interest rates to zero or buying bonds of both the government and the companies, the scale is unprecedented, as shown by this chart. And we would expect this monetary expansion to reach financial assets like stocks, quicker than the real economy. Second, while the headline indices have rebounded, not every stock has. Airlines and banks, for example, still very much down on the year, whereas tech giants like Amazon, who perhaps stand to benefit from the more work-from-home theme, have soared. But the most important factor is that the market always tries to predict the future and move ahead of it. So in that sense, we should not criticize that the equity market is higher. We just must hope that it is right and that the economy will soon follow. And in that sense, may prove to be less of a disconnect and just more of a timing issue, guys. Well, we certainly hope that that's the, the, the fact because uh, we all want to see uh, the economy get better. And it's so interesting. There is such a dichotomy, such a difference between 
real life people's experience in the stock market. Some people don't have access to the stock market. They're busy stocking shelves and feeding America and working as hard as they can to get back to their their businesses and, 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 and their jobs. And so it's, it's so interesting to see that vast difference, Stephanie, between the stock market and what many people are going through right now. But, Jose, even if the economy returns, you've got to ask yourself, what do you want America to look like a year from now? Do you want to only be shopping at big box stores and chain restaurants? Because many of those big box stores in retail, for example, were yep. allowed to be open throughout this period because they were considered essential. And sure, if you're fast food and fast casual, you can pivot to take mm -hmm. out. It works for you. But if you're an independent retailer, you can't right. control the supply chain. You've been shut down for a very long time and you can't just pivot to digital. I'd say the same thing for a restaurant in Miami or New York, independent restaurants, which we could lose forever. Yep. So while the stock market is about those big numbers, yep. we could lose the heart and soul of what America is. Just one point I was going to pick up and uh, end a thought on, guys. We, we have an experience of this before. From the start of 2010, which was when unemployment peaked after the last recession, over the next five years, wage growth averaged 2 percent. S&P 500 equity market returns averaged 14 percent. Clearly a response that benefited those uh, with more assets than those with not without. And we have to hope that that isn't repeated this time. We won't know the answer of that, of course, for a couple of years. But uh, so far, the equity market rebound far, far stronger than the eco economic rebound. And let's uh, hope that the economy does pick up soon. Thank you very much. And that wraps up this special for Stephanie Rule and Wilfred Frost. I'm Jose Diaz-Blart saying thank you for the privilege of your time.